Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with my favorite nonfiction books of 2021. Now as with all of my favorites videos, um, these are not going to be just books that were published in 2021, they're just ones that I happened to read last year, and I have not like ranked these, um, I just put them in order that I read them throughout the year. So the first one I want to talk about, I actually also mentioned in my miscellaneous favorites because this is kind of a combination of nonfiction and like a poetry, like a spoken word poetry kind of thing, and that is Light for the World to See, A Thousand Words on Race and Hope by Kwame Alexander. This is pretty much a long form poem slash essay um, about the United States and its history and present of racism and it deals a lot with the trauma of the past but also how there is some hope. Um, I've said this a few times when I talk about this particular book and a couple others that are like this or that deal with this topic and that is that I think this is a really good balance of acknowledging the harm um, and dealing with it and talking about the fact that it's not in, it's not just in the past, it's still happening and we need to do something about it while also having enough hope that you feel like you can do something about it, um, like there is hope for the future. I mean as you can see for um, from the title, I think that is an important focus of this book as well, and I just thought this was fantastic. I did listen to the audiobook, which is narrated by the author, um, and it's a very quick one, but it really, really packs a punch, and I really loved it, and very grateful that I saw this on Ashley from Bookish Realms channel, um, because I hadn't heard of it before this. Next I have another one that kind of blends nonfiction and poetry, um, and that is Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. This was my first Jacqueline Woodson book, and this is probably one of her most well-known, if not her most well-known. Um, you can see the many award stickers on the cover here, and this is her her memoir in verse um, that is intended for a middle grade audience or like that is written as a middle grade nonfiction. Um, so it blends a lot of things that I think a lot of us don't often think of going together, but I absolutely loved this. Um, this is the, this, reading this book was my first Jacqueline Wilson book and it was all it took for me to like fall in love with her work and to see exactly what everyone was talking about. Um, this is just about her childhood and growing up. Um, she lived in New York City, but it also talks a lot about when she was younger and she lived in the South where she would visit her family there. Um, I just think she writes beautifully. I think she has this wonderful clarity to her writing. Um, she doesn't, like the thing about poetry is like precision is really really important, like not necessarily using the most dramatic word but using the best word and I think that's what she does, which like her writing is not overly simplistic but it doesn't draw attention to the fact that she chooses the perfect word every time, if that makes sense. Um, I just thought it was beautifully done. She talks a lot about obviously um, her own life but also like her family and um, different different experiences she had that obviously deals with um, racism and she is growing up during the civil rights era and the book does talk about that but it also talks about other aspects of her childhood and how she wasn't always thinking about that when she was a kid and um, it talks a lot about schooling and I yeah I just really love this I'm already wanting to reread it and again this was all it took to make me a Jacqueline Woodson fan so um, highly recommend this one if for some reason you haven't read it yet I know I'm very late to the bandwagon here Next I have The Artemisia Files, Artemisia Gentileschi for Feminists and Other Thinking People, edited by Mike Bell. Um, this was actually a gift from my lovely friend Yvette from Book Cave, and obviously I loved it. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi is one of my favorite historical figures, one of my favorite painters, so I am always happy to read more nonfiction about her, and I think this was a really great collection. Um, there was only one essay that I did not care for, that I pretty strongly disagreed with like the purpose of it or the the points that they were making. Um, I'll link my wrap up down below because I go in a lot of detail on each of these essays, so I won't do that here, uh, but there's only one essay that didn't quite work for me. All the others I really liked, and there were a few in particular that I thought were incredibly insightful. Um, like the first one in the collection actually is by Mary D. Garrard, and it's about the way that Artemisia painted hands, um, painted women's hands specifically. And I just think that's a phenomenal essay. Like she talks a lot about the specific way that Artemisia painted women's hands, which was that they were very strong and that they were very um, like useful and practical. Like they looked like actual hands that you would be able to use, um, as opposed to a lot of her contemporaries who were men who tended to paint women's hands as just like kind of graceful um, nothings. Like they were there to drape and look pretty and that was it. Um, and she talks like not just about the symbolism of that but about how like the specific choices that Artemisia made about the way she painted women, you could see those in something as small as her hands. And I just think it was a really great blend of like the symbolism of like, um, you know, like strength and, and painting women to be strong rather than pretty, like that fits into Artemisia's body of work and I think that the essay talked about that a lot, but also on a more practical level how you can use that to actually like attribute paintings to, to Artemisia or to other painters. Um, so yeah, I just really really loved this collection, very glad I read it. 
Next I have Letter from Birmingham Jail by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, this was one of our past at Classics picks so I will link that live show and um, pretty unsurprising this is on this list. I had read part of it in a class um, like in high school so it was, it's been a while but I don't think we ever read the whole thing and I'm so glad that I have finally read the whole piece. Um, this is like it seems weird to even review this because it's famous for a reason. Um, I think like I love the writing obviously. I think it's a really important topic. Um, I think there's a lot of quotes here that do not get pulled for Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, and I think this is like reading this piece just makes it very clear how Dr. King's image has been softened and like watered down and like people like pick and choose elements from his speeches or from his writings um, to make him seem a lot less radical than he was and like I just highly highly recommend this if it's been a while since you read it I think it's worth it's always worth rereading or if like me you hadn't ever gotten around yet to reading the whole thing like please pick it up. Next I have Twisted the Tangled History of Black Hair Culture by Emma Dabiri. Um, this is a book that I think its original title was don't Touch My Hair, I think, uh, when it was originally published in Ireland. Because Emma DeBerry is a black Irish author and this has gotten a lot of praise and I absolutely agree with it. Um, I thought this was fantastic. Um, as far as the writing, I think Emma DeBerry does a great job of really drawing you in. She's a very engaging writer but she's also, um, she really balances the like personal experiences um, like of herself and other people with specific cases, um, with like historical aspects. Like I just think the different pieces of this nonfiction book come together beautifully. Um, and then as far as the topic, I just think she does an amazing job of like talking about how black hair is not just hair. Um, like the way that that it interacts with racism and colonization and oppression and like even even the idea of like laziness how that can relate to um like taking care of your hair or taking care of yourself like this book just covers so much and it doesn't ever feel like too much um like she talks about like laws that regulated the way um that enslaved Africans could wear their hair um she talks about like the the like good hair versus bad hair thing, um, how that relates to colorism. Like she talks about again like her own personal experiences and people she knows. She talks about hair dress codes and how those are really racist and like ro like rooted in racist ideas and perceptions of what is like neat or like professional looking hair. Um, just this book covers so much so well and it's I think it deserves all the praise that everybody has been giving it. Next I have Antigone Rising, The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths by Helen Morales. Um, and this was actually another present from Yvette. So Yvette, you did a great job with the nonfiction gifting. <laughs> Um, yeah, I thought this was fantastic. Going off of reviews, I think this didn't work for everybody as well as it worked for me, partly because um, it, it seems like some people weren't happy with the connections the author drew in some of her chapters, but like she says in the introduction, so I, I should tell you what the book is about, it talks about um, classical myths and classical stories and how those affect our world today, like how they affect our culture and the stories we continue to tell, um, the things we value, even things like dress codes and diets and stuff like that. And going off of reviews, it seems like some people were frustrated by this book because they didn't, they, they think the author was reaching with some of the connections she made. And like the thing is she says in her introduction that some of these um, chapters, some of these arguments she's making are going to be very direct, like this, we can trace this perspective or this institution back to a specific thing in the Greco-Roman world. Um, but then sometimes she's just using it as like a like a jumping off point, like thematic resonance kind of. So I feel like she's very clear about the fact that she's not saying that every single example she gives is like, I can definitively say we get this from the Greeks. So that that's a little like frustrating. It seems like some people just they, they didn't like that she did that even though she warned us she was going to do that. Um, so keep that in mind that this doesn't work for everyone but I thought it was fantastic. Um, I think she, think it was really well argued as I've been saying with pretty much all the nonfiction I think on this list is she writes in a really engaging and approachable way so I think this would be um, several of these would be like good kind of starter nonfiction books. Um, I, I really love some of the specific chapters. Like I mentioned in the wrap-up where I reviewed this one, um, she talks about Beyonce's Ape Shit video, like the music video, and I loved that chapter. Um, I think the way that she like um, analyzes that is just really, really impressive. Um, I also really loved the chapter on Antigone, um, which is a play that I love, and I just really like the way that she she talks about Antigone as a role model, but then also how what Antigone does in the play, how that's kind of different from, like how maybe what she does is not always 
the goal like um how Antony is not a great example of solidarity for example like between like working together with other people which I thought was really interesting and I'd never heard someone talk about that before. I also appreciate how intersectional this book is. Um she does talk about women of color specifically and the way they are treated. Um she does talk like, there's at least one or two chapters on um like queer identity and like one of the stories she talks about is um Canius who I had I don't think I'd heard that myth before but um how it's it's a, it's a very early literature example of a trans character and how even though there's some things that are not you know we would not tell the story that way today how um it does speak to how the, these ideas of gender are not new um so yeah i obviously really loved this again keep in mind that not like her particular like the variety of connections she draws is not something that works for everyone but anyway i loved this one I guess I can stop saying that because these are obviously my favorites. Next I have The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green and this is probably one of the most surprising nonfiction books um, to end up on this list because I had no intention of reading this. Um, I have read, is it three of John Green's books or two? I can't remember. Um, one of them I really hated, one of them I liked at the time but I don't think I would like anymore and I think those were, I think it's just the, the two that I've read. Um, so I had no intention of reading this, but I was seeing reviews from people about how amazing this book was and how even if you didn't like his other work, you would enjoy this. And then what really convinced me is I saw um, my name's Marinez talk about this book and she sold me on it. And I'm so glad she did because I absolutely loved this. Um, this is a collection of essays um, that are based on John Green reviewing different things in the world, um, specifically in the Anthropocene, which is a suggested name for the current age that the Earth is in, where humans have a really huge impact on the Earth. Um, and some of them are like, like just there's a huge variety of things he reviews, like Canada geese, velociraptors, teddy bears, um, air conditioning, <laughs> like it's, some of them are really funny, some of them are really poignant, and I think one of the things I love about this collection is that um, it's not just some essays are emotional and some of them are funny, although there are some like that. There's a lot of them that kind of go back and forth, but I think not in a way that felt jarring. Um, I I love the way that John Green writes. I love the way that he is so eloquent and also ta like is not afraid to talk about things that are emotional too. Um, also, I, I learned from reading this book that John Green and I have a lot of the same fears, um, so sometimes reading parts of this were a little rough, um, but it's a very cathartic experience and this is one of the books that, like I've said for a few others, it's made me realize, or not even realize, it's made me articulate more that in order to have something that feels hopeful, you have to acknowledge like the hurt or how bad things are um because i have not been reading books about the pandemic like we are still in the pandemic i am not ready for that i don't i can't really picture when i'd be ready for that this is one of the only exceptions because a lot of what he says is informed by um the covid19 pandemic but i think he does such a good job with it this is such a humane and compassionate book um I, I just, yeah, I really admire, like, even though I had mixed experiences with his work, I've always really admired John Green as a person, and this book really just confirms that. Um, I, yeah, like, there, there are some, I can't even really get into favorite essays <laughs> because I love so many of them in different ways. Um, I just really love the way that he talks about, like, the horrible things in the world, but also the beauty in the world, and how that it can, you can feel very torn. Um, I know this book has gotten a lot of hype, so I'm kind of just piling on to that, um, but for me at least, it not only lived up to everything I heard, but it exceeded expectations. Like, I I just really, really fell in love with this book. Um, there were many tears that were shed, because again, this was just such a cathartic experience. Um, like, the way that he talks about, like, things like grief and suffering, but also about hope and beauty and how, like, you shouldn't be ashamed to enjoy things. Like, this book just made me very emotional, I felt very seen. Um, I, I I think also just it's very interesting, like the different topics he picks. I like I learned a lot from this book. Um, yeah, like I, I just I can't recommend this one enough. Um, I think if you have also been on the fence about it because of your experience with John Green, I would add like other people have that that shouldn't deter you because it is very different. Um, this is obviously a very personal book for him to write, so I don't know that he would plan to do another one, but if he does more essay collections, I am absolutely going to buy them and read them because I loved this so much. I also really loved We Had a Little Real Estate Problem by Cliff Nesterhoff, The Unheralded Story of Native Americans and Comedy. Um, this is a book I have not heard 
too much about. Um, I first heard about it from Beautifully Bookish Bethany and I'm really glad I did because I thought this was fantastic. Um, I do want to mention that this is not by a native author. Um, it's by a very well-known apparently comedian, uh, comedy historian, but the only place that he really like inserts himself into the book at all is the introduction, which is only a few pages. The entirety of the rest of the book is really focused on the comedians that he interviews. Um, I think Nesterhoff did a really good job of like staying out of it and just letting them like tell their own story in their own words and like I'm, I'm not native so I can't speak to how well that was done but it seemed at least like he did a good job of not interfering um and I just thought this was really fantastic this is a book where um I had heard from reviewers that you could really get a lot out of this even if you're not into stand-up comedy um or like if you don't like it that much or if you don't know that much about it and i agree um i've never been that into stand-up but this was so valuable and interesting and funny um i definitely went and looked up videos of some of the like comedians and like the groups that he talks about or that are covered in this book um and i think this is a really great blend of comedy with the really serious history behind all of this and i also really liked how it takes a historical view like it doesn't just talk about modern stand stand-up and like native comedians um doing modern stand-up or other kind of comedy work it talks about how like the the wild west shows and it talks about like um different like different eras in history so like all the way back to like the 1800s um it also talks about like the silent movie era and um something i mentioned before that i really appreciate is how we see that people caring about things like representation is not like a brand new thing like for for this generation or anything um because even back in the silent movie era there were like native groups who were like hey could you maybe cast native people to play native people rather than putting white people in a bunch of brown makeup um that would be great so i i just appreciated that as well um there are parts of this book that are very difficult to read because they deal with things like the residential schools um and the like genocide of native peoples so it's not like even though it's a book about comedy there is some darkness here but i think that both of those things were given the time and the care that they needed and i just would really recommend this book not just for what it says about like um comedy and like different cultures and how important that is um but also just for the history of native peoples in north america just i think this is fantastic i would definitely be interested though in recommendations by native authors on this topic if anybody has them next i have joan of arc by herself and her witnesses by regine pernude and this is translated by translated from the french by edward hyams and i read this one um as part of the read the renaissance book club and i'm so glad they picked this book because i had not heard of it and i thought this was really great now this is one of the books on the list like i gave this one a four star um I think most of the other books I think this is the only book on this list that I gave four stars and then there were two that were four and a half that I'll get to everything else was five stars but I had to put this book on this list because even though it wasn't a perfect nonfiction book for me I loved it so much and I learned so much and it was just a really like I'm just so glad that I read this book because again I hadn't read I hadn't heard of it before um and I'm really really interested in St. Joan of Arc I really love her and I love learning more about her and I just think this book is so valuable because again it's by herself and her witnesses so we get these really long um excerpts of joan's own words and like of the people um called to testify in her in her trials i just feel like this was such a valuable opportunity to get to know her a little bit like um of course it's always hard to make to draw conclusions about somebody's personality when you just have um writings from them in a very specific context but the little glimpses we see of how smart she was of how uh, like she had a sense of humor that she that she used sometimes even in these horrible situations um just like what an incredible person she was i just really appreciated that i actually have a whole discussion video where i talk about this book and i review it in addition to a novel in verse and i talk in that video a lot about how we adapt historical figures so i won't go into that aspect too much i'll just link that down below um but i just really really appreciated this it meant so much to get to see joan's own words and to see like what she did and what she said and how again how brilliant she was when she was w when these people were, were deliberately trying to trip her up um and one thing I also really liked about this book is how I think Regine Pernou did a really good job of like really debunking some big misconceptions about Joan and about her trial. Like there are several um, big points that she makes that um, I think debunk some popular like misconceptions or assumptions about Joan and her trial. Um, like Regine Pernou makes it very clear in this book that this was a political trial um, first and foremost. It was disguised to look like a religious trial but it was about politics. Um, she also talks about the like wearing men's clothing thing and how that was like that's stuck in the public memory and imagination um, as like what led to Joan's downfall and it was but only in the way that it was manipulated and that it was used as an excuse to 
execute Joan when that's what they already were planning to do. Anyway, I get into this a lot in that video, so I will link that. Um, but I am just really grateful that Read the Renaissance talked about this book and assigned it um, as part of their book club because I really, really enjoyed this and I got a lot out of it. Next is one of my 4.5 stars. So again, this wasn't like a perfect nonfiction book for me, but I really, really loved it. And that was The Defiant Middle by Kaya Oaks, How Women Claim Life's In-Betweens to Remake the World. As you can see, lots and lots of tabs, um, lots of quotes and examples and points that I think were brilliant and that I wanted to remember. I have a whole review on this one, so I will link that down below. But this is a really short nonfiction book, but that really, really packs a punch. Um, it talks about women throughout history and how, um, how all of these societal and cultural ideals of women um, are impossible to live up to and how um, women have always been caught between um, between those ideals and this much more complicated reality um, and how despite this women have been able to do really incredible things but also how they shouldn't have to they shouldn't have to achieve things in spite of that. Um, like, I really like the examples Kaya Oaks uses. I think this is another very, very readable nonfiction book. Like, I I read this in basically two sittings, even though I was thinking it was, oh, it's a nonfiction, I kind of want to spread it out. Like, I sometimes think of nonfiction books as ones that I won't be able to read um, in big chunks, even if they are very readable, but this one I just sped through because it's just so engrossing. Um, I really, really love a lot of the examples Kaya Oaks uses. I really appreciate how intersectional this is in terms of queer folks. Um, I do also really love the way it's structured, like the different chapters are all named after things that women are not supposed to be, like young, old, crazy, barren, butch, femme, or other, angry, and alone. Um, I just think that like that structure was really great and I think Kaya Oaks did a really good job of um, using that structure and yeah, I, I just thought this was really fantastic. Definitely recommend it. And this book does specifically have a religious focus, um, but it also deals with just women from history in general. Um, and I would definitely recommend this if like the topic interests you at all. I think it's a really, really well-written, compelling, um, well researched and well backed up example of what it's what it's doing. Next I have Steeped in Stories by Mitali Perkins, timeless children's novels to refresh our tired souls. Um, and this book just speaks to so many things that are important to me. Um, I mentioned that in the introduction she's talking about the importance of adults reading children's books, like the necessity of it, which obviously I believe in very strongly. Um, she talks about the importance of rereading, which again I am a huge fan of. Um, and then the majority of the book is about looking at classic children's novels and um, how they can have really valuable insight for our trying times, um, which I really, really loved the way she did that. I also love the way that throughout the book she grapples with the harmful aspects of these books. Like, she doesn't just say, um, like, ignore it and read them anyway. And she also doesn't say that it's impossible to get something out of a book that is not 100% um, like moral and perfect. Um, I just really appreciate the way she engaged with that. I've mentioned that I think one of the signals that this book did an amazing job um, is that several of these books, I think at least three of these books, are ones that I did not plan to reread at any point. Um, and now I want to. <laughs> so that, that's pretty amazing, I think. This is another book that does have a religious perspective because she is taking each of these children's novels and using them to talk about one of the seven heavenly virtues. Um, so keep that in mind. I just think this was brilliantly written. I love the topics. I love the way she engaged with those topics. And I love the way she used her examples, even to the point of making me want to reread things I had no intention of rereading. <laughs> Next on my list was my other 4.5 stars, and that is Humankind by Rutger Bregman, A Hopeful History. Um, so again, not a perfect book. I get into that a lot in the wrap-up where I talked about this book, so I will link that down below. Um, but this is a book that is about how the assumption or the um, the belief that a lot of people have that humans are inherently selfish and bad um, and that we have to constantly work against our, our bad natures in order to do good, um, how that's not really true. Like how the majority of people are, are good, are more good than bad. And um, just what a, like the fact that we have had this data since basically we've been collecting data on this and yet it's not well known because it goes against, it goes so strongly against what we've grown up believing which is that humans are um, inherently selfish and bad and um, just like, I, I love this book. Um, I kind of, I feel like this book has made me um, recognize or accept or maybe just remember that I feel like I'm sort of a sad optimist right now because when it comes down to like really basic things like you know is is there good in the world can people do good it's like I think I am an optimist but I'm 
I'm struggling because I look around at the world like because like a lot of us I look around at the world and things that are happening and what people are doing to each other and it's hard you know to believe that there is more good than bad in the world. So that was kind of the perspective I was coming to this book with is like I I think I'm an optimist deep down but I need to be reassured of that because it's hard to remember that right now um, and I think this book did a really great job of that. I think he does a great job of using um, like using these examples. I think my, one of my favorite parts of this book was him debunking these like really famous experiments that supposedly prove that humans are the worst all the time, um, like the Milgram shock trials, the Stanford prison experiment, um, the bystander effect. Like those are kind of the big ones that are used to support this theory, this assumption that we all accept that like humans suck all the time. <laughs> and humans do suck a lot of the times, but not all the time and maybe not even most of the time. Um, and that's what this book is doing. And I, I feel like I'm not being very focused in this review, but I go into it very extensively in that wrap up. So I will link that down below. Um, but yeah, I really like the way he uses examples. This is one that is written, I think, very much like a narrative nonfiction. Um, like it's like a page turner. Um, because of the way he'll like play with your expectations and I just thought this was really really interesting, really valuable. I think this is so important. Um, I think that this is this is a book that like if more people knew this information and like accepted it, I think this would make a huge difference in pretty much every aspect of human life because like this is such a game changer. And finally the last nonfiction book that I want to talk about is Better Not Better, Living on Purpose in the Pursuit of Racial Justice by Yusuf Salam, who is of course one of the Exonerated Five. Um, I just read this one in December so I won't go into it too much here because I just wrapped it up. Um, but this is a memoir by Yusuf Salam about obviously his wrongful imprisonment um, and what happened before and after that um, and also before and after the exoneration, um, his exoneration with the other men. And I mentioned also that a big piece of this is a spiritual memoir because Yusuf Salam talks a lot about his faith in Islam and how that pulled him through like the really horrible things that he went through. Um, I just I thought this was really compellingly written. I think he does a great job of talking about his specific experience and how that relates to these wider systemic issues like the the way that the um, American justice system functions. Like he talks about systemic racism and the American justice system and all of that. Um, and I just think he does a great job of connecting these very personal, um, personal aspects with the wider, um, the wider material he's talking about. Um, I also, I meant to mention this in my wrap up and I forgot, but I love how much we got to know his mother, um, and also his, his wife. Um, he, he was married to somebody else, but now his current wife. Like, I just love both of these women so much. Like, they just seem like incredible people and I really love that we got to see what an important part of his life, um, these women are. Like, I just really loved that we got to see that. Um, and something else I mentioned is how amazing it is to me. Like, the title of this book is Better Not Bitter. So, Yusuf Salam does talk about, you know, being like being so upset with like the state of the world and how people are treated and how you can use that anger to fuel change and how that's a good thing. But he's also pretty amazing about like not being bitter about it, which like I said in my wrap up, like I think it would be understandable if he was bitter about what happened to him. And the fact that he isn't is pretty amazing. I also don't want to make it sound like that should be the expectation is that you just get over these things. I'm just saying that it would have been really understandable if he was bitter and the fact that he isn't is pretty incredible. But yeah, really, really recommend this one. It's just a fantastic memoir and I'm really glad that I read this one. Okay, everybody. So those were my favorite nonfiction books that I read in 2021. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick them up. Let me know one of your nonfiction favorites that you read last year. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!